and welcome. My name is Francesca Gianni and I'm an art historian and I'm here to talk to you about the work of Robert Irwin, James Turrell and Olafur Eliasson. In the course of this 30 minute uh, talk we will look at uh, not only the works that are on display in the galleries here at Oklahoma Contemporary on the occasion of Bright Golden Haze, but we'll, we will also look at uh, works that these three artists have created in the past and we will see how their contributions have affected the discourse um, uh, of perception and light and space in the last uh, few decades. Now, as you will uh, notice, um, uh, Robert Irwin is the eldest of the three artists. He was born in 1929, so he's, he's in his early 90s right now. And uh, James Turrell was born roughly 20 years later. And Olafur Eliasson is really here to represent the next generation when compared to Robert Irwin. Now, as you may know, James Sorrell and Robert Irwin um, are exponents of a Southern California art movement that emerged in the 1960s and that we often refer to with the term of light and space. And so they have been around for quite some time. And um, I'm going to... Um, discuss here the work of uh, Eli, um, Olafur Eliasson um, also because he is an artist of the new generation that really responds to the um, uh, contributions in light and space uh, by Robert Irwin and James Turrell. So without any further ado, uh, let's move on to our first artist, Robert Irwin. As I said, Robert Irwin was born in 1929 in uh, Southern California. As he likes to define himself, he was as California as it gets. So growing up, he had, uh, as he likes to remind us, a very happy childhood spent on the beach and on the surfboard. Um, he was um, <clears throat> interested uh, in uh, swing dancing. He was actually a professional dancer. And um, he started drawing and painting in his early 50s. Um, he was in the army and thanks to the GI Bill, he was able to attend three art schools and as well as travel throughout Europe and expand his art artistic horizons in that way as well. And to pay the bills, well, he surfed and he danced professionally and had bet on horses as well. He also taught at three different art schools, especially at Srinard. He was able to influence countless uh, artists that ended up uh, becoming big names in, in the art world namely Ed Roche, whom you see in this image, uh, hanging out at Srinard with his fellow artists, Joe Good, um, Jerry McMillan, and Patrick uh, Blackwell, um, as well as Via Clemens, and um, who will also, whose work you will see here in the galleries at Bright Golden Hayes, and um, Larry Bell, who's another exponent of the light and space uh, movement, and that you see here in a shot at the Ferris Gallery, which was the hip gallery in LA, at that point, and the gallery in which Robert Irwin was able to uh, showcase his first work. So Robert Irwin started as a, an abstract expressionist, and you see him in this image acting very much sort of like Pollock-like or uh, perhaps de Kooning-like with his white t-shirt against this abstract expressionist work. And he was able to produce a series, um, a body of work that he himself defined as very bad art. So he was very unhappy with absurd expressionism. He wanted to find a way to express energy, but he didn't want that energy to come from himself. Uh, he wanted that energy to be pure and to be something that uh, was not being expressed in a brush stroke or in an energetic way to engage with the canvas. And that is why and how he moved away from abstract expressionism and towards his dot paintings. In his dot paintings, he's applying very small amounts of pigments onto the canvas in the form of dots. And as you step away from the canvas, um, these dots um, take the form of a sort of a, a halo or an aura on a very soft uh, energy that seems to hover above the canvas. And that's exactly what he wanted to achieve. However, 
when he got to his dot paintings is also exactly the moment in which he realized that he hated the frame. He did not want his work to be bounded or to be limited by an edge. And he realized this is not how we look at reality. Reality does not have a frame. So in time, he arrived to his discs. The discs, uh, there's a variety of discs, but they all um, involve the use of um, a surface that is suspended um, off the wall and through a strategic and calibrated uh, use of light and shadows, the object seems to float uh, away from both the wall and the surrounding environment. And this is as far as you could get from the canvas and he felt successful at that, but yet, he will not um, get to the art practice that will characterize the next 40 years of his career until he shut down studio. He sold everything that he owned. He gave away everything that he owned. He put himself in the desert for some time and he started asking himself the big questions, right? Who am I? What is art? What am I doing here? What kind of artist do I want to be? And that is how he got to the so-called conditional art. Conditional art is defined as an art that responds to the conditions of the place and to as little, as few preconditions as possible. What does that mean? It means that Robert Irwin, when he enters a space that he knows he wants to um, sort of inhabit with his own uh, installation, he just spends time in the space. He doesn't plan, he doesn't think about um, a project, but rather he runs through the possibilities with his senses. And then with time, he comes up with a series of conditions that will in time become an installation. This is something that you can achieve as an artist when you suspend uh, judgment, as he likes to say, when you reach a state that is referred to with the word epoche. Epoche is a state of suspended judgment. It's a state that is similar to the emptiness that is predicated by Zen Buddhism. And it's a place in which you create a blank canvas. You erase every sort of preconception that you may have about the world and about yourself and about the life um, that you have lived and embrace the sensorial, sensorial responses to a space or to a work of art. And this is really the key to Robert Irwin's aesthetic uh, philosophy. Now, for his conditional art, um, he uses very simple uh, materials, uh, things like black tape, fluorescent light, natural light, um, and most importantly, well, strings, wires, but most importantly, scrim. A scrim is a surface, it's a nylon surface that um, creates at times a translucent and at times an opaque effect um, according to the inclination of the light and therefore, very importantly, according to the position that the viewer takes in relation to the work. And that's what's so important to uh, Robert Irwin. He wants you to remember that you are the one, you the viewer, are in charge of the perception of the sensorial experience that you're about to, um, to unfold or to sort of open for yourself. Now, Excursus at Dia uh, Beacon in New York uh, is also a, an installation in which he had an opportunity to use scrim and to uh, create this so-called conditional art. We're here in front of an environment that is composed of a variety of rooms and where, is, where there is no hierarchy. That means that the viewer can decide where to enter, where to exit, what room to go next. Every room is different from the next. Um, there are different colors, different textures and nuances. And the way uh, in which the viewer chooses to move forward is purely instinctual and emotional. So as a viewer, you can choose to perhaps move to the aqua green room and then leave the purple one for later or perhaps change your mind along the way. And that's the whole point of conditional art. 
perhaps his most uh, important contribution so far um, to the art world has been the uh, installation at Marfa uh, titled uh, Dawn to Dusk and dated um, uh, 2016, which is something that he was able to realize using an abandoned uh, military building, a C-shaped uh, building lined, completely lined with windows. Uh, the idea here was to um, interpret this space based on what he considered the most important elements at Marfa, that is sky and land. So the installation at Marfa is really a tribute to the Western landscape, so much so that he found a way to uh, lower the windowsill of the pre-existing windows, of course use his sort of signature scrim um, devices and to create what he calls a, a Dutch painting-like uh, kind of view of the sky and the land uh, and basically the American West uh, um, outside. Now we're here and we, we can talk about Lucky You, uh, which is of course here in the gallery. Now this work belongs to a series of works that Robert Irwin has been interested and engaged with in the, in the last few years. Um, for his fluorescent light works, he's of course using these um, um, uh, shafts, for fluorescent shafts uh, that are usually uh, displaced vertically um, against a white wall or against a scrim and in order to obtain this uh, saturation in color but also in light he um, wraps the uh, tubes in um, theatrical gels and theatrical gels are what give give us this uh, um, very saturated but also very transparent and translucent um, uh, very central color um, the uh, light um, can be, of course, different. And um, as a viewer, Robert Irwin does not want you to approach the work pictorially. That means he doesn't want you to step away from the work and to look at it from a distance. Rather, he would rather <laughs> would prefer that you approach the work as close as you can safely get to it. Um, um, approach it along the side and to look at each color and to let each color um, have an impact, emotional impact uh, on you. Okay, so now we are in front of uh, a work by James Turrell. And so we go from Robert Irwin to James Turrell, who, as I said earlier, is roughly 20 years younger than uh, Robert Irwin, but with him was involved in the light and space or so-called light and space movement. Now, I think we can say, uh, safely say that James Turrell is the artist who um, is most interested in light and more specifically is interested in the thingness, as he calls it, of light. That means he, that he's interested in treating light as an object, as a three-dimensional, uh, fully volum voluminous object. Um, he um, started, um, he says how he's not interested in using light as a way to reveal something, but he wants light to be the revelation itself. And that is something very difficult to do. You have to come up with tools to do that. And that's how he came up with the um, projection pieces. The projection pieces consist into a um, sharp um, beam of light that is directed towards one corner of the um, installation gallery. As you enter the gallery, you do not see the source of light. It, all you can see is this uh, fully uh, voluminous um, sort of three-dimensional body that is entirely made of light. It is an incredible work to witness in person. Um, but a bit more about James Sorrell. Um, he not only studied art, but also studied astronomy, uh, math, and perceptual uh, psychology at Pomona College, which was an experimental college um, near Los Angeles in the 1960s. But most importantly, uh, James Sorrell is a pilot and he considers his plane as his studio. Anything that he senses and that he experiences uh, during his flights over the desert in particular end up informing his work. 
Something to keep in mind that, that uh, Terrell likes to remind us is the context of uh, 1960s uh, California, Southern California, but Los Angeles in particular. Uh, Los Angeles was in many ways um, a um, frontier of a sort uh, because it was the place in which the average middle-class American could achieve uh, his or her middle-class dream of a domestic, of a suburban home with a swimming pool. Um, but it was also in many ways um, representative of the final frontier. That is because California was heavily involved in a space race. Um, um, the um, Rockets would be uh, launched from uh, Florida, they would be controlled from uh, Houston in Texas, but all the material was produced in Southern California. And that means that many artists in the area had material, space grade materials unheard of before um, that they could have access to. And also there was a sense of, incredible sense of optimism and uh, sort of anxiety for the space race. Of course, Southern California, uh, Los Angeles of the 60s was a lot more than that. It was uh, um, student protests, uh, race riots, social unrest, but that also contributed to this um, sort of climate of excitement. Um, and James Turrell um, was heavily involved in, um, in the um, space <laughs> race. Um, in fact, together with Robert Irwin, he was involved in the in experiments on astronauts uh, who would then uh, fly, uh, you know, go to space. And we see him here in an anechoic chamber together with James Sorrell, a young Robert Irwin sitting on the chair with uh, James Sorrell behind him. An anechoic, cha anechoic uh, chamber is a uh, chamber where sounds don't occur, there's no echo. And that is, it was a way for them to study the effect of uh, the lack of sound, so perceptual studies on the astronauts, as well as, of course, um, uh, on their own work and artistic practice. Um, they were involved with NASA. Um, they held the first national symposium on habitability in Irwin's studio, as a matter of fact. So the two of them, both Irwin and, Tor and Torrell, were, he were heavily involved in the, the sort of excitement um, um, towards space. That all of this to say that this obsession with space and light uh, was informed not only by the climate of Southern California, but also by um, the space race. Uh, James Sorrell was raised in Pasadena in a Quaker fa family, and I think it is safe to say that um, he was um, informed by how um, um, the austere, simple Quaker architecture um, hinges heavily or relies heavily on the use of light. And in these images you can see how a traditional Quaker worship um, uh, place as well as a more modern one uh, carries resemblances with one of James Turrell's sky spaces. And that leads us to uh, some of his most uh, well-known work, the, the sky spaces, which are these structures um, that the viewer, the visitor can enter. And within the structure, the viewer can sit on a bench that runs along the uh, interior of the structure and look up. Once the viewer looks up, um, they can see an aperture on the ceiling uh, or an oculus and this aperture gives visual access to the sky. So you simply walk into the sky space, you sit down, you look up into the sky. Um, that sounds like a pretty uneventful um, experience. However, at sunset and sunrise, um, these sky spaces um, uh, have a so-called light show. Um, that means that a series of artificial lights uh, begin to operate um, and generate colors uh, that complement the changing nuances and textures um, of the uh, colors in the sky at sunset and sunrise, which are um, moments in which the changes are more noticeable. You will see in this video a compressed in time version of a light show which normally lasts 40 to 45 minutes. 
and you see both the sunset and sunrise experience. So these are um, experiences that James Terrell wants us to stop us for. He wants us to pause and to really have an opportunity um, to create that epoche that Robert Irwin also deals with, that sort of state of suspended judgment in which we really notice all the different nuances, the subtle changes of the experience. Another important uh, work by James Sorrell is the Gans, uh, Gansfeld. Now, Gansfelds are these environment in which a saturating, foggy, misty, and incredibly bright light inundates the space entirely. Um, this is a work that emerged from his study on um, perceptual um, psychology at Pomona. And in these environments, in these Gansvilles, you walk as, as a visitor and you really uh, look for a place upon which to rest your eyes, but you don't find it because the light is so saturating. And so the overall effect is one of almost hypnosis. Um, they are beautiful environments that are also somewhat disorienting. Now, perhaps his most uh, or his best known work is Roden Crater, um, which is in the uh, high desert uh, near Flagstaff, uh, Arizona. There is no date associated with this work, as you can see, um, because it has not officially opened. Um, it will open um, hopefully in the next couple of years, but this is an extinct crater, a volcano that James Sorrell um, took a hold of and adapted into a celestial observatory and a work of art, um, creating a, in its interior uh, something similar to the sky space experience. This is a place where you have to um, travel to and you have to invest an incredible amount of energy and time. And of course, this is to reiterate what James Sorrell looks for from us. He looks for our time, our um, sort of contemplative um, enjoyment of the work. Atten Rhein is another incredible work that James Sorrell created for the Guggenheim in 2003. Um, here we have the upper um, uh, floors of the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright um, building shut down to the public uh, which only had access to the um, uh, ground floor rotunda and <clears throat> transforming that space into this weightless um, um, almost a heavenly uh, uh, sort of vision of changing lights. What is incredible about this work, which by the way brought uh, record numbers of visitors to the Guggenheim, um, is the fact that this sense of weightlessness, this weightless um, image, um, in fact hides an incredibly hefty uh, multi-tiered metal and, and wood framework underneath. And this is something that um, uh, Terrell likes to play with, the idea of ambiguity between uh, weightless and um, sort of weight and weightlessness or flatness and bidimensionality. He likes to um, have us viewers question what we see. He likes us to question our perception. He believes that as human beings, we tend to uh, believe that the world is presented to us and we do not realize that in fact, most of what we perceive and experience depends on our own choices and perception. So now we are in front of um, the um, work that is on display here at the galleries at Oklahoma Contemporary. Um, this is an incredible work. Uh, and again, um, James Terrell is using uh, sort of um, technologies um, uh, that are, uh, he's always at pace, keeping pace with technology. And in, in this case, he's using a hologram which is a um, recording of a light, of light waves on a um, transparent um, layer of emulsion. And within this layer, every um, um, image has a full parallax. That means that um, no matter what position you occupy in relation to the work, you will see the object in full three-dimensional um, shape and presence before your eyes. And of course, in this case, unlike with 
um, normal holograms, uh, James Turrell is not showing us an object, but he's showing us light itself as a way to remind us, of course, that that is what he's interested in. He's interested in light as, uh, as an object. Okay, so now we're in front of the work uh, by um, Olaf Eliasson, uh, Black Glass Eclipse, which you will also have an opportunity to see at the um, uh, current installation, Bright Golden Haze. We are into the next generation of artists that work with uh, light and with space. So what is uh, interesting about Olaf Eliasson is that he really works with the same, some of the tenets of um, um, light and space art or um, um, uh, sort of the practice of Robert Irwin and James Sturrell and he takes it to a step further and we'll see in what way he does that. But first let's look at what he um, it did uh, before. Um, he emerged as a young artist in the early 90s and one of his first debut um, uh, pieces was uh, Beauty which um, entailed the use of a curtain of a sort of tiny droplets of water um, through which um, Eliasson shone a light. And according to the position of the viewer, um, you could sometimes see a rainbow. Um, this is perhaps, this is his first um, um, meteorological work and perhaps his first environmental work. Uh, later on, uh, Eliasson will manage to bring sandstorms, uh, uh, sunsets, and other uh, various uh, meteorological phenomena uh, within the walls on, of institutions. And this is certainly something that he was inspired um, um, uh, over the course of his childhood, um, Olaf Eliasson is a Danish Icelandic, and um, it is interesting for that matter how, um, even though he's not from Southern California, as a matter of fact, he's as far from Southern California as it gets, he was heavily influenced from the, by uh, the work of Erwin and Terrell. Perhaps his most successful um, uh, work um, was the Weather Project, which was installed in 2003 at the Tate Modern in London, and which was an incredible undertaking, um, an enormous work that um, um, entailed the use of a large mirror uh, on the ceiling that reflected anything that happened below on the ground, but also reflected the um, half circle of monofrequency light, which would then be reflected by the mirror and effectively turned into a full sun. As a matter of fact, the weather project quickly took on the um, nickname of Sun, and it uh, drew record numbers um, of visitors to the Tate Modern, and um, it was the most uh, visited and most reproduced work of the first decade of the 21st century. Um, what was interesting about this work was the fact that he was able uh, through this um, enormous mirror, but also through the use of uh, fog, um, to create an atmospheric and um, sun-like aesthetic uh, to the environment. And so people truly felt that they were uh, witnessing a, a meteorological phenomenon of a sort. But at the same time, the fact that all these people were together in the same place allowed them not only to be um, aware of the fact that they were all experiencing a very personal uh, encounter with this uh, solar entity of a sort, but they were also experiencing each other's presence. And that is really the key uh, to um, Allah for Eliasson's uh, work. Um, all kinds of strange things happened at the Tate Modern. Um, people came to protest, um, uh, people came to have picnics and, spell, and spend extended periods of time. It became a sort of um, uh, place where community was uh, beginning to rise. Olaf Eliasson um, 
is also a rather uh, socially engaged artist. Uh, he really began at some point in his career to engage politicians, um, businessmen, and anyone who he thought was seriously and genuinely um, interested in um, creating change in society, but also people whom he hoped um, he would be able to influence with this work. And so um, he, you can see him in TED Talks, um, he talked at the UN, he met with the Dalai Lama. He was a very, he's a very socially um, engaged um, artist. One of his projects, for instance, is uh, Little Sun, which you can also, uh, by the way, find um, for sale here at the, at the gift shop. And this was an initiative um, um, that was driven by the desire to uh, provide light uh, to the over one billion people who in the world do not have access to um, and electric uh, to electricity. And so these small solar lights were um, able to provide um, uh, illumination in houses for uh, students to do their homework, for families to uh, perhaps delay their uh, dinner time so that they could use uh, more of the daylight. Um, it was an incredibly successful uh, work that testifies to his um, social engagement. And now we are in front of the uh, work that is actually on display at Oklahoma Contemporary. And what do we see here? Well, here we have this object um, that entails um, two um, curved surfaces that are mirror-like, and yet they are black. Uh, within these two surfaces, we have um, um, this special kind of light that uh, monofrequency light, which nullifies colors and turns them into um, a sort of gray scale, well, a yellow gray scale in a sense. Um, you can interpret this work as, as you want to interpret it. Um, I hope that it, it is clear by now that all these works um, do not so much offer uh, a message from the artist um, as much as they offer an opportunity, a platform for us viewers to contemplate on our own sensorial and emotional reaction to the work itself. Um, so there are different ways you can interpret it, there are different ways you can react, but something to consider here is that this is a work that annuls colors, it annuls differences amongst people. Something else to consider is that it is clearly a work that um, responds to the work of James Sorrell, for instance, right? And yet, we see the use of a mirror. A mirror reminds us that we're not the only people experiencing uh, this work. There are other people around us that are sharing that experience to us, with us, and that is exactly the shift that Olafur Eliasson uh, operates from the achievements of Robert Irwin of James, or James Terrell. He turns the sort of contemplative theater that um, the previous uh, generation of artists have implored us to, um, to experience in, in their work into something that is much more socially aware, uh, much more participatory, and in something that um, encourages us to um, look, look around us and not only at our own experience. Um, so I hope that um, it was clear in this talk uh, what the contributions of Robert Irwin and James Sorrell were and how uh, Olafur Eliasson um, uh, contributed further to that discourse on uh, perception, on light, and on social awareness. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today.